welcome to the first of the monologues across the spectrum series. Uh, the first monologuer is Joanna Grace. So I will start with her bio. Joanna Grace is a sensory engagement and inclusion specialist, doctoral research, author, trainer, and TEDx speaker. She's the founder of the Sensory Projects, which run on the understanding that with the right knowledge and understanding in expensive items can become effective sensorial tools for inclusion. In all of her work, Joanna is seeking to contribute to a future where people are understood in spite of our differences. Now, I met Joanna two years ago uh, while she was giving a training course that was particularly helpful on the senses. And uh, after exchanging some messages, I read her book, her recent book, The Subtle Spectrum, um, which is a very honest account on uh, her story uh, before and after the diagnostics of uh, being diagnosed as an autistic woman. Um, so, um, in the monologues, what we aim for is that each speaker will be allowed to tell us more about her inner landscape. So without further delays, Joanna, the floor is yours, which probably would mean no shoes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it would mean no shoes because um, like, many autistic people I experience sensory differences and one of those differences means that wearing shoes is just uh, an unnecessary difficulty in life. I, I can do it just fine and I do wear shoes um, but doing it takes a little bit of concentration and so when I met you I was talking about the senses to everybody and I wanted to be able to give that room all of my concentration and not to waste a little bit of it on shoes and so when I present professionally I do so barefoot and as an autistic person who has access to language I'm able to specify that in advance of coming anywhere to work so the people that booked me for that presentation that you saw would have had to sign a contract in which I say, you will let me work bare feet. And if I if I stump my toe or cut my toes, I take responsibility for that. Don't worry, I won't sue you. Um, and as somebody who can self-advocate like that, I can lead a life where I don't have to wear shoes. Um, but I always think about people who are less able to advocate or who communicate in ways that are less heard than the ways that I communicate, who might have a greater need not to wear their shoes than I do, um, but who would be forced to wear their shoes. So yes, I'm, I'm a barefoot presenter. So, uh, yeah, we agreed uh, that uh, when I want to speak, I will raise my hand. Uh, this uh, may seem a minor detail and, uh, well, probably we could go on without doing it. But this um, is a minor gesture that uh, represents that some people might, or us, uh, might uh, have trouble with... Um, stopping speech and being able to focus, to listen on what the other person will say. And uh, many times, if we get interrupted abruptly, uh, this might trigger not nice response from uh, our part. Would you like to elaborate on this, drawing from your book also? Well, it's another, it's a lovely, respectful thing to do. And as I am, trained as a primary school teacher, putting your hand up is a thing that I definitely respond to. Um, for myself, uh, so a, a common characteristic of autistic people is difficulty with the turn-taking nature of language. And 
that can seem it can be taken as rude um it can be assumed that you're not interested in what other people want to say um for myself I experienced that in a couple of ways so one this is going to sound like a very early plug um my little boy wrote a book called my mummy is autistic and in his book he um, draws pictures that talk about my language processing differences so when people talk to me I think of it as do you remember the old computers that used to buffer you know if you've got a slow internet connection the data comes through slowly and you get those little windy things on your screen so all all the words come into my brain but it takes me a while to process the meaning and in situations like this where you have very kindly told me what we will be talking about ahead of time I know what meaning I'm expecting so the skim read that I get of that information when you ask me the question I can go oh yeah that relates to whatever this is and you said you met me on a training day I've been working professionally as a trainer for about a decade and only in maybe the last year or so have I been including question and answer sessions in any of my training days because you don't know what questions you're going to get do you <laughs> and it mostly works because people ask you questions about the topic that you've just been talking about. And so my guess as to what they're asking me about from the very quick skim read of what they say to me that I that I get when people talk to me is mostly right. But I do quite often sit on the train going home. And it's not that I don't process the meaning, it is just delayed. So I, it will just sort of, it's sort of still spooling around in my head and I'll be on the train going home and I'll think, oh, well, that's not what that person asked at all. They actually asked a completely different thing. And I, I talked to them about this and they were asking about that. They must wonder why I was going on. About but people are so lovely, people are kind. And I've never had anybody mind that I made that mistake. So that's one aspect for me of that language confusion is that delayed processing. And the other one is that I often overlap people when they speak and that's viewed as interrupting. But what's going on is I don't always know when I'm supposed to be speaking, when I'm not supposed to be speaking. And a lot of other social things, I don't know, you know, when I'm supposed to be smiling or when I'm not supposed to be smiling or when I'm supposed to be clapping and when I'm not supposed to be clapping. These things that happen as a social group, as a, as a community, ordinarily, you're supposed to do all those things at the same time. So like when everybody else claps, you join in with the clapping. When everybody else laughs at the joke, you laugh at the joke. And so part of my brain thinks, oh, they're talking, must be the time for talking. <laughs> and I suddenly start talking at the same time and then they'll go quiet and I go quiet and so I've got the turn taking it's just I'm taking the same turns as the other person and you're supposed to go one person and then the other person um, but it's just those little idiosyncrasies that you get used to and I think we are or I, I hope we are moving towards a world where people are better able to understand each other's differences and and when I do those sorts of things it's not always read as rude people just I hope people read it as difference I, hello and hello to your cat oh this is Gray hey <laughs> it was it was my daughter that gave her names that correspond to the colors uh. <laughs> So um, yeah, I was listening to you and um, and thinking that uh, yes, we mimic. I mean, we tend to to mimic the response uh, of the other. And sometimes this happens with language. In autistic people, it's very common to have trouble with the I and you, uh, and uh, and to talk as being talked um and and not knowing how to how to respond um and uh and yes that that forgiveness of uh on the part of the other 
uh, it's absolutely crucial. I will share to you with a, a moment that, uh, that I shared before. That is today, I started my day as a witch in the preschool um, doing a, a Halloween event uh, where we were uh, using a, a potion to make natural inks. And I, I, um, I did it with a, a supposed neurotypical person. Uh, and it was wonderful to do it together. I had the clear feeling if I was doing the activity with preschoolers alone, most likely I would go into the cauldron immediately and burn as a witch uh, because I was missing the, um, those subtleties uh, of interaction uh, that are so clear when the supposed neurotypical person is that is the, the, um, the helpers, the educators, they immediately started talking to the other person that was doing the most social interaction while I could focus on uh, doing my stuff. That is knowing about the nature and the species involved to produce natural inks. So I would like to give, leave you these two hints. One, because it's on your book also, what means subtle? And, um, and the other, that is, how can we collaborate? In what conditions can we collaborate with uh, and cross the divide with, uh, with the supposed neurotypical person? That's, that's really interesting. I was thinking about what we were saying before with um, talking and turn-taking. When I wrote The Subtle Spectrum, it's partly my story, but it, it, a lot of it is, um, I read lots and lots of other people's stories and lots of people gave me bits of their stories to inform that book. Some incredibly brave people, some of the anonymous contributions to that book are people who were um, frightened to tell that aspect of their story but felt that it would have value and so have given that contribution, not because they wanted to share it, but because they recognised it would have value to others. Um, but I also read an enormous amount of research around autism to inform the book. My husband was joking with me that half the pages in the book are just the bibliography. <laughs> so if it looks like a long read, it's mostly references. But I was remembering one of the studies I read showed that um, autistic people are more often interrupted than um, non-autistic people. So in a communication between an autistic person and a neurotypical person, although the understanding is that autistics interrupt because we're bad at the term taking, we actually got interrupted more times than we interrupted. So there's a perspective view there as well. And that leads into um, like the work of researchers like Damian Milton who pioneered the double empathy work you know we understand the nature of communication between people who share our neurotype um, and that's something that's common to all humans um, but in autistics it's pathologized because it's different to the presumed norm um, and so it becomes like all of the other um, minority points of view you have a presumed norm that is normally what is it it's a, a a white middle class male who's got a job and is able-bodied and is neurotypical um, and is straight um, you know and and anything other to that is seen as in some way defective or deficient but this is just a different neurotype um, <laughs> and so you asked me about the subtlety and I suppose I was trying to indicate the part of the autistic spectrum that I inhabit which is the part that when people tell when you say to people I'm autistic they say oh you don't look autistic or oh like, are you sure um is the bit that most passes for neurotypical the um, it's the bit of the spectrum where people begin to say, oh, we're all a little bit autistic. Um, and so it's a, it's a difficult 
part of the spectrum to see because the aspects, the places on the spectrum where nobody would ever question, you know, the people, and I work with autistic people um, and I've met autistic people for whom nobody would ever say, oh, yeah, I'm surprised you're autistic or you don't look autistic because they very much do look autistic and do behave in autistic ways and are very, very noticeable and very, very obvious. Um, and I'm always worried when I speak as somebody who faces very few barriers to access in life, that I would detract from the experiences of people who face enormous barriers to access. Um, the, the lovely thing for me has been that whenever I have spoken, it's the people, <laughs> It's the people close to those people, the people whose loved ones face all those barriers, who get in touch and say, thank you, you've just said something that my loved one can't say, or you've just explained to me an aspect of what I'm seeing there that I couldn't understand. Um, it's like I said at the start, you know, I'm allowed to present with my shoes off, but somebody who has a greater need, um, it, it, <laughs> not need somebody like me to say, but benefits from somebody like me saying. Um, so the, there is overlap across the whole of the spectrum. I, I do a thing, I probably did it when I saw you, about it being a spectrum, but it also being a binary condition. You are either autistic or you are not. Um, and there is a huge range of experience within being autistic, just as there is a huge range of experience within not being autistic, but it's not a continuation one from the other. It's it's an either or, and so I likened it to um, when when we met. I was pregnant, which is another spectrum condition. There's a huge range of experiences within being pregnant. Um, there's a huge range of experiences within not being pregnant. But when, as a pregnant person, you have a conversation with somebody who's not pregnant, you might say things like. Well, none of my trousers fit anymore. It's really depressing because I can't wear any of the clothes in my wardrobe. And the other person might say to you, oh, none of my trousers fit either. I've put on some weight recently and it's really, I can't face buying bigger clothes. And, and when they say that, you feel understood because here's somebody who knows what it's like to not fit into your trousers. And then you say, oh, my back really hurts because the, the baby is pushing against my spine. And this person that you're talking to says, oh, yes, I've had a bad back too. It's horrible, isn't it? Have you tried, you know, sleeping with a pillow at night or something? And you feel understood. And if you say, um, oh, I have to get up all the time in the night to go for a wee. I need to go to the toilet all the time. And they say, oh, yes, I need to go to the toilet now. Perhaps we're all a little bit pregnant. At that point, you want to hit them. It's no longer friendly. As soon as you claim the, the other person's experience, it, it really changes the dynamic. It was a lovely, empathetic, you felt understood, and then it's just boom, no way. Mm -mm. And it's the same thing. There are huge numbers of experiences that overlap the neuro divide. You know, none um, neurotypical people can like consistency, can struggle with social communication, can like routine, can have a really strong interest in a topic, can experience sensory differences, that's fine. And all of those experiences are really valid and help people to have empathy and insight into what it's like to be autistic. But they don't make you autistic any more than having a bad back makes you pregnant. But just like the pregnancy one, if you are noticing lots of those things popping up, like if you have got a bad back, you do need to wee all the time, none of your trousers fit and you've missed your period, it's probably worth getting a test because it's really useful to know which side of the divide that you're on. Um, so in terms of collaborating across the divide, it's just understanding the difference, isn't it? Because once we understand those differences, we no longer find them frightening or offensive and, and we're able to do the translation. So yeah, very interesting that uh, um, 
I don't know what I call it because, um, for instance, in my part, I have a really trouble with metaphors, but um, I love figures. For instance, what you brought now is a figure. And in my case, I understand it as a proposal of form. Like, should we consider the spectrum uh, of being autistic or being neurodivergent or being uh, just neurodiverse, which supposedly we are all, fits on the figure of uh, being pregnant. And in my case, this helps me to think, to bring these figures into this discussion. For instance, I thought, well, that's a very good one because not all the people that are pregnant will share the experience of pregnancy. I mean, many of them are annoyingly okay. I mean, they will not feel their, their, their back hurting. They will not feel nauseous or they, they will be just, a, you will be talking to them about uh, how you're feeling and they will be feeling something else, right? So, uh, so it's very important because uh, I think that sometimes we are made to believe that uh, we become affiliated immediately by belonging to a category uh, and uh, at the same time that we might expect the unexpected by being in a category and expecting others um, at the same time uh, yes uh, we might not be English and still like tea right I, I think um in the subtle spectrum, I wrote about, uh, I, I was trying to map the journey that people go on after they are diagnosed in adulthood, because what I had noticed from reading lots of blogs and lots of other people's accounts is that there are certain stages that seem common to all of us so I, I was thinking it's like we recognize that there are stages to the grieving process and understanding those stages can help people who are experiencing grief to accept the process as they go through it so one of the stages of grief is to feel very angry with the person for dying and leaving you and when you encounter that you feel like a terrible person because you, you shouldn't be angry with a dead person and they obviously didn't you know most people didn't die on purpose and so you feel bad about yourself because you feel that emotion but then somebody tells you you know this is an emotion that most of us feel and then you don't feel so bad about yourself for feeling it you're like okay this is part of a process that I, it's not that I'm a terrible person this is just a normal human thing to feel and there seemed to be, I, I can't think of a positive one. I was thinking like the stages of alcohol addiction and recovery from addiction is another one where we've got these set stages that we, we sort of as a society are aware of that the person has to accept they have a problem and then they have to be willing to, you know, and you can't help them until they've accepted that part. I need to think of a positive one because autism isn't death or addiction it's it's just a it's a it's a it's a neutral experience um but I was noticing that there are these stages that people go through and I set out to try and map those stages um and when I say map I mean the sort of map that a friend draws you on the back of a napkin at a restaurant rather than an ordinance survey, you know, scale drawing. It's just an approximation. Um, so I've mapped these phases that people go through and it's a, a awareness that you're different. Um, and then a, a realization that that difference is of a particular type, that in my case, I'm autistic. And then accepting that that type applies to you and then you have this awareness of all the ways that the world is skewed because of that difference. And then at some point down the line, you accept it as your identity. And when I was reading all the research, it's very clear that accepting autistic identity is really good for you. It's good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health. Um, and at the start of writing the, sub the subtle spectrum, 
I had not accepted my autistic identity. And so it's very difficult to be writing a book where I clearly know that at the end of this emotional journey that I'm telling people, I'm supposed to have come to this acceptance of my own identity. And so I was hyper aware of the things that were stopping me from doing that. And the big one for me, and this is just for me, from my experience, I'm, I'm somebody who has always worked with people with profound disabilities, uh, people with neurodiverse conditions. Um, in my um, childhood, my mum used to take me to the local special school and I would play with the differently abled children there. I first worked as a support worker for a brain injured gentleman when I was 13. I've been a foster carer for children with complex special needs and disabilities. Um, and I've worked within the special education sector and within adult care. And I think the youngest person I've worked, no, I know the youngest person I've worked with was a day old. And I think the oldest person is 87. Um, and the, the, the big thing for me was that autism is viewed as a disability. And when I said I am autistic, I didn't want people to be thinking I was saying I am disabled. Not because I think there's anything wrong with being disabled, but because I don't consider myself to be a disabled person, or I didn't then. And I felt very strongly that claiming that would be to do some sort of wrong by the people that I've known through my life who genuinely are disabled. I, I didn't want to be saying that the struggles that they face are my struggles or the barriers that they face are my barriers. And so I went round and round in my head trying to work out whether autism is a disability or a difference. If it was a difference, I was fine with it. If it's a disability, I had a problem with it. And I, <laughs> you've read the book, so you've seen all the machinations. Um, and in the end, I had to accept that it's both. And that I can be an able person who is disabled. And it's a really tricky one because one of the traits of an autistic brain is the tendency to think in a binary formation. Things are right or wrong, good or bad. It makes us very good. Uh, we're, we're very good at morals. We're very good at sticking to rules because it's that nice, clear thinking. Uh, we're often good at maths because, again, you need that clear thinking. It's, it's a useful brain skill. But in situations where there are these shades of grey, it becomes very tricky to get your head around things. And I, I recognise better now that I'm somebody who is both. Um, I, had a, I had a really good example a couple of weekends ago. I was interviewed um, by, uh, I don't know if I should say that, I was interviewed by a big organisation that produce lots of um, video clips and memes and training throughout America about supporting people with learning disabilities and they like to challenge stereotypes and things like this and so I had to I was very um, I was very excited that they wanted to film me uh, and I had to drive uh, about 100 miles to to get to the filming location and they they flew from America and drove to meet me so it's fair enough that I should do the last bit of the journey and when we were filming they were really impressed with me because I was able to articulate little chunks of information in ways that were accessible. When they told me where they needed me to look for the camera, they said, I'll, one of them said, he said, I'll sit here because we don't want you to look at the camera. We want you to look in this direction. So I'll sit here and you just talk to me. And I said to him, I'm autistic. If you want me to look in that direction, you're probably best not to sit there because I won't naturally make eye contact with you. If you sit 45 degrees around, that's fine. I'll look straight between you and the camera. And I got all these things right. I did all these things right. So, you know, yay me. Um, but I got lost five times driving there. Um, I was so nearly late. I The first time I got lost was at the end of my own road. Um, and I was driving using a sat nav. So I've got a little blue dot that's telling me where to go. And no matter how hard I try or how much support I have, you know, even with the sat nav saying, turn left, turn right, 
I still consistently get lost if I try and navigate to places. And that is nothing other than disabling. There's no flip, there's no perk to that. And I, it was one of the things that surprised me most about my diagnosis because I'm very familiar with autism from an education landscape because I'm a teacher and I, you know, I, I never realized that um, geographical navigation is one of the sort of checkbox things. But in my diagnostic report, the lady wrote, you know, she gets lost all the time. This is a clear sign of autism. Like, oh, is it? Oh, well, yeah, that's me. Yes, very, very interesting, this, this example, because, um, yeah, disability will emerge on the face of difference and expectations of a certain standard. That's, that's when we got this feeling that we are disabled. For instance, if we are just using a train, um, there's no issue here, right? Uh, the issue comes when we have to learn a new skill or, uh, or do something that we see that we, we lag way behind. Um, but again, uh, that's supposed to be neurodiversity in the sense that we are all a little bit different. But then we have neurodivergence. That is when we have, uh, well, some are way... <laughs> <laughs> more different <laughs> than others on specific traits. Um, for instance, uh, in, the, in the activity that I did with preschools, uh, we, I had only two, ch two children clearly different. One was the one who started crying when I put the slime seaweed into the cauldron. Uh, and uh, and my friend said something that they really troubled me. That is, oh, it's okay. We're not witches. We're human. And this this for me it strikes me when uh, when we have to justify that we are human. And uh, and the other one was clearly way neurodivergent, and so she was crying all the time. She could not stand there. Um, I would not be surprised uh, if, she, if she would be autistic. Uh, I then had to join her in a room where she was with her caretaker, super happy, playing with, um, with a car and a guitar. And, um, and I must say to you that although I felt odd in the sense that I don't know how to how to interact with that neurodivergent child I mean I, I stay there in all but uh, at the same time it's much more calming to me than it was to be with the crowd so one of the things that I would ask you is do you think that your work with um with the uh, people with profound and multiple disabilities actually is easier or harder or in what terms than engaging with supposed neurotypical and i'm i'm always using supposed neurotypical because uh, um we never i mean we never know there's not there's not a neurotypical diagnosis, is it? So uh, so so everybody should be neurodiver neurodiverse, um, uh, and some can mask better than others, right? But anyway, there is this joint feeling of being in the same vibration that Hannah Gatsby describes very clearly, like being autistic in her words, is to be the only sober person in the room or the other way around. So that's what I leave you here. Yeah, so most of my work focuses on people with profound and multiple learning disabilities. Uh, these are people who have multiple physical disabilities, multiple cognitive impairments, uh, multiple sensory impairments, they often have epilepsy and other medical conditions and many are expected to lead 
foreshortened lives. And as a research geek, when I read the research about them, they are described as the most disabled members of our society, which is quite an accolade. Um, and I think you asked, is it easier to communicate? <laughs> so there's something about meaning, isn't there? There's something about meaning and language. And when our brains acquire language, it changes the structuring inside our brain. It has a hugely biasing effect on our view of the world. And we see the world very much through a language filter. Um, and one of the ways that that filter affects our understanding is that we begin to think of meaning as being a language based thing. Um, when actually words are just tools that we use to convey units of meaning, they're not the meaning itself. Um, and that use of words to convey meaning is something um, that becomes tricky for autistic people in a social situation. We were talking earlier about that turn taking or the language processing. Um, you quite often find autistic people happier with typed communication because there's less expectation that meaning will be conveyed through other ways, you know, through facial expressions or gestures, because it is just the words and you have more time to go back and check what you've written. So a thing for me, um, I, when I'm communicating with somebody, I will have a purpose to that communication. There'll be a reason that I'm communicating. And so I want to start with that. <laughs> like. Um, Whatever the, whatever the purpose of it was, whatever the function of it was, but you're supposed to start with, hello, how are you? Um, nice weather, how's your day? Um, so in emails, when I write to people, I write, hello, um, you know, what time do you want me to arrive at your venue? And then I go back up <laughs> and write in at the top, hello, I hope you're fine. <laughs> and in an email, I can get my social communication correct according to the paradigm that's expected whereas when I'm speaking verbally it's trickier for me to do that but another thing that autistic people struggle with is or not struggle with another place where autistic people and neurotypical people don't always understand each other because it's a struggle both ways and Damien Milton's work underlines that actually autistic people are better at understanding across that divide than neurotypical people are, even though we get diagnosed as people who can't understand across that divide. And we're not better through reason of any great talent or, you know, extra ability that we were given. We've just had more practice because we live in your world. So we had to practice. And if you practice, then, then you get that understanding going back. Um, but that, um, oh, I've lost the I've lost the train of that. But that um, the the um, social order, and oh no, I've talked quicker than I can think. Um, that that use of language, it, it'll come back. It'll pop back up in my head in a minute. Um, that use of language is something that can be tricky. I know what it was. I got it <laughs> it was that we say what we mean so when somebody asks me oh how are, how are you today I want to answer the question that I've been asked which is to give you a rundown of my psychological well-being which is definitely not what they want to be told they want to be told fine yeah and I would never ask in an email as myself hi how are you because I don't know you that's a deeply personal question I'm asking you about the depths of your soul and your private life as a like a way of asking you about what time you want me to arrive at your venue um so those sort of um social you know extra layers and extra meanings are, are confusing and when you interact with somebody who doesn't use language as a communication tool then you're just dealing in meaning and the wonderful thing about people with profound and multiple learning disabilities is they are without artifice. They don't put on a front. They don't pretend to be 
something they're not. They're wholly honest, they're wholly direct, and you get to meet the genuine person and interact as your genuine self. And so, yes, for me, if you just put me one on one with a person with profound and multiple learning disabilities or one on one with a, you know, a random neurotypical stranger, I would find it way easier to communicate and share meaning with a person with profound and multiple learning disabilities than with the neurotypical person. Very interesting. So I'll go to the next jump. The exactly the point of how are you? Um, that is, yes, how, how, when do we, in this case, you access or fail to access that inner landscape? Um, uh, which is basically the emotional aspects of the experience of being autistic which also relate to the senses, as you very well described, um, interoception, a very mm -hmm. forgotten sense, a very important one for emotional processing, um, which is absolutely critical for mental health, well-being, and being with others in our own body, minds, and skins. So if you feel comfortable, I would love you to yeah. elaborate on that. So um, you go to work on a Monday morning and you walk down the corridor and your colleague says, hi, how are you? Nice weekend. And then they, they don't stop walking. You're supposed to answer that question in the time it takes to walk past them. And you are supposed to ask the question back to them. So, so you're meant to say, fine good weekend how are you that's that's <laughs> I've got that wrong so many times because um on on a day-to-day -day, it's going to be how are you fine how are you fine that's that's the pattern on a Monday it's likely to be how was your weekend um and and I would always as I was driving to work I would plan what my little sentence was going to be for the day so that I've got it ready to go because I, I won't make it up quickly enough on the spot because I'll still be thinking, oh my goodness, they want to know my psychological history. Ooh, I really don't know if I need to tell the geography teacher how I am. Um, but if you pre prepare them and then you've got them ready to go, mostly it works, um, but not, not always. And I've had some wonderful standoffs where people have walked down and they've said, um, did you have a nice well no I thought they were going to say did you have a nice weekend because it was Monday but they didn't they said how are you but I answered with a very confident yes so they went how are you I said yes and then they were confused and so I thought oh dear I've done this wrong and my my thinking was I've only got until the moment that we pass in the corridor to to fix this so I stood still because then it would I would have more time and then they were surprised that I'd stood still so they stood still and then I thought oh no 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 I don't want to have infinite time for this conversation I would like this conversation to pass and then they just didn't know what happened because I just said yes and stopped abruptly still and now they were standing opposite me and they didn't really know why they were <laughs> so when, when the planning goes wrong it goes really badly wrong but that question for me how are you is actually a really complicated ask um, and I am as you said at the start I'm a sensory engagement specialist so most of my knowledge about the sensory systems comes through my work with people with profound and multiple learning disabilities for whom sensory communication is communication that's how we share meaning is through touches and smells and tastes and sights and so it's really useful for me to have a rich understanding of the sensory landscape and of what types of sensation are most likely to engage somebody what types of sensation are going to be easiest for those complicated brains to process what sensory you know resources can I share that will get that connection with you um, and I run 
<laughs> on the sensory projects, I generally run to seven senses. So the famous five senses, and then I include two subconscious senses, your proprioception, which is your awareness of where your body is in space, um, and your vestibulation, which is your awareness of motion and balance. Um, but, but it's dangerous because once you start dealing with subconscious senses, it's a bit like um, people talk about smoking marijuana as being a gateway drug and it leads you to stronger stuff. It's like that. Once you start dealing with subconscious senses, it's very easy to slip in some more of them. And there are 33 sets of neurons that control our sensory system. So arguably you've got 33 senses, but it just depends how you group them. It's like stars and constellations they get grouped together in clusters so how you group them is how many senses you come up with as having and interception is my you know once I've done proprioception and vestibulation it's that's the next really tempting one because it's really unusual amongst the senses you know like I like smell is unusual amongst the senses because it's the only sense processed by your limbic brain by your emotional brain and all the other senses go through your thalamus your thinking brain so smell can you can get a really emotional response to somebody from a smell but interception is unusual as well because all of your other senses are about sensing the world around you and your interception is about sensing your internal world. And so when somebody says, hi, how are you? It's actually a request for interceptive information. You know, the person who can answer that question easily, they say, I'm happy. I I'm feeling a bit down. And they feel like they're reporting an immediate thing. But what they're doing is they're using their interceptive sense to look at their emotional landscape. I, I need more words. Their interceptive sense is the sense that feels their feelings. So your feelings might be represented in your body in a number of ways. You might um, have your stomach churning and your heart beating really fast because you're feeling nervous or excited. And so when somebody says, how are you? Your interception goes, oh, my heart is beating fast. My stomach is churning. I am nervous. And for somebody who can do that, it's instant. But if you have, you know, all of your senses can have differences in processing, can have differences in ability. You know, just like you could have a visual impairment, you could have an interceptive impairment. And I'm somebody who struggles to feel my internal landscape which doesn't mean I'm somebody who doesn't have feelings. It's just I don't generally know what they are <laughs> unless they get really big. Um, so I have, a, I have some examples of this from my life that um, illustrate it well. And um, one of them just popped up on my Facebook of, uh, yesterday. I did um, an event called Raising the Bar, which is a conference that we organised to promote the core and essential service standards for supporting people with profound and multiple learning disabilities, which is a mouthful, but it's a great document and it's free on my website. Um, and we had done this conference and you'll see, I shared a photo from it yesterday. I spent the whole day at that event just smiling, you know, the sort of smile that hurts your face because it was such a wonderful day. And then at the end of it, I got on the train because I travel by train because you don't get lost on rails. Um, I traveled all the way back to my, um, he's, he was my boyfriend then, he's my husband now. And he knows what I'm like after I've done a big day. I no longer make sense when I'm talking, if I am still talking. He just takes me into like a little dark room, gives me a plate of food and switches the television on and then I'm happy. And um, he, he put me in the little dark room. He gave me the plate of food, he switched the television on. And, and I was sat there like this with my um, fingertips in my cheeks. And he didn't say anything for a while and then he looked across at me <laughs> and I'm sat there like this and he said okay Joe what are you doing and I thought why is he asking me that question and then I realized that my hands were all over my face and I thought oh what am I doing 
and I was trying to work it out. And I said to him, my, my face is too high up. <laughs> Because my my cheeks were hurting because I'd been smiling. So I was I was physically trying to pull them back down. I hadn't realized I was happy, but, but I was trying to pull my face back down. <laughs> like, oh, I've had a really good day, actually. That's what I'm doing. And then that didn't help because then that was hilarious. And then my cheeks went further up and it's no good. And then we had another thing when when we were getting married. Um and I'm somebody for whom, uh, so autistic people are good at focus and my focus is the work that I do. Um, it's not my job, it's my whole life. And from time to time, people will give me that nice advice where they say, oh, you should take some time off and relax. You're like, that would not be relaxing to me. That is advice based on a neurotypical model. What is relaxing for me is to be at work and to get it all done. It's lovely. Um, I'm quite happy to work. You know, people who know me online will know that I'm there, you know, on social media until until I fall asleep at night. And then I'm at my de I There's no part of my life that isn't um, dedicated to this. Um, but I was going to get married. And... Um, <laughs> that's a big deal and I worked up until six days before our wedding um, and up until six days before our wedding I had a dress uh, a venue and um, somebody who was going to marry us but we hadn't done anything else so we hadn't decorated or all of those other frilly bits and people kept asking me like as I was out and about at work are you excited? Are you excited? Oh, you're getting married. Are you excited? And it was really annoying me. And I, I would come home to my husband and say, people keep asking me if I'm excited. They think that I'm, you know, one of these silly people who just gets caught up with decorating chairs and making, you know, wedding advice and that, I, that my brain is going to be full of all of this froth just because I'm getting married, just because I'm getting married doesn't mean I'm not interested in my work. Just because I'm getting married doesn't mean I can't read research. They think that my mind has gone to jelly just because I'm getting married and they keep asking me if I'm excited. And, I, and he said, you mustn't be cross with them because those are people you work with. And I was, I'm not, I just say yes. Like I know the answer, yes, I'm excited. But I was furious with them. Like, And then it got worse. Um, people started, you know, people, my friends started to ask me if I was excited. You know, and, and I was more of like people I work with, fine, you don't know, you know, you might think I was one of those people who will just forget about my work life and become a, a, a you know, all interested in dresses and things. Um, but my friends should know me better. My friends should understand that my life is my work. What are they asking me if I'm excited for? And then the final straw was my sister wrote me an email and the subject of the email was, are you excited? And she hadn't written an email with it. She literally just sent the title and I was livid with her. And my husband sent a text message to all of the family going, nobody ask Joe if she's excited. It's not, it's not safe. <laughs> and we got to the six days before um, and, and we sorted all the stuff, you know, he booked somebody to make food for everybody and everybody was coming. And we got married in a little village hall near where we live that's a very old building it's very pretty it didn't need any decoration and our plan had been um I have a, a vase from my grandma and I have a vase from from my other grandma and they're both um dead and I thought I'll bring these vases to the wedding and I have a little vase that I bought for myself with my pocket money when I was in Spain as a four-year-old and I've got these vases that are of sentimental value and the idea was that we would bring these vases to the reception, to the to the venue, and our guests would pick wildflowers as they came to the wedding and they put their wildflowers in the vases. And that's how we were going to decorate the venue. And it broadly worked. Um, turns out my husband doesn't have any um, vases of sentimental value but he did have a lot of alcohol bottles that he really liked. So he cut alcohol bottles in half and sanded them down. And so we had like grandma's vase and like half a bottle of really nice whiskey and things dotted around the venue and people bought their um, wildflowers to put in it. But the day before we got married, 
when everything else was done, he and I were in the venue just putting out the vases and there wasn't anything else to do. Everything else had been done um, and it was just him and I quite like him. Um, and we were just in this little quiet town hall putting out these vases. And my heart was like going like this and I could feel it, which is unusual for me. And I was thinking, gosh, my heart is beating really fast. Is, is there something wrong with me? And I looked and I was like, I've only come up three steps, so I shouldn't be out of breath. That's not a lot of exercise. You know, these vases aren't heavy. What, what's going on? And then I realized and I looked at him and I said, I think I'm excited. And he said, yes, you are. And then I twigged why I'd been so cross with those people is because we don't like being asked questions we can't do. It's like jumping out at somebody and asking them to do complicated maths. And it's embarrassing when it happens at work or in front of people that you care about. And I don't, you know, I'm quite, most of the time, I'm quite happy not knowing how I am because it doesn't means that how I am doesn't interrupt what I'm doing. But there is definitely a use to knowing. And since I've lived with my husband, he tells me how I am, which is a very enabling thing that he's doing for me. Um, you don't, it, it's, it feels strange to tell somebody else how they're feeling because it's very presumptuous, isn't it? You're feeling happy, you're feeling sad, you're feeling stressed. You, you don't tell somebody else that because that's their feelings and they know. Um, but for me, it's really useful when he does that because he will say to me, you seem stressed today. And I think, do I? I feel fine. And then he'll say it again, you, you know, the next day, you seem stressed. Like, oh, he said that yesterday. Oh, I wonder what's going on. And, you know, and a, and a few lots of that will make me look around and think, OK, is there something that's causing this stress that he can see that I can adjust? Because when I lived on my own before, I wouldn't know I was stressed until some part of my body gave out. <laughs> And so I frequented emergency medical centers quite a lot because in common with a lot of autistic people, because our emotional processing is different, because our awareness of our emotions is different, quite often it will have physical symptoms. That's that's in common with people, all people's emotions affect, you know, if you if you're nervous about something, you get an upset tummy, things like that. that there is a connection there. And so, yeah, I used to need a lot of emergency medical treatment and I no longer do because somebody tells me my emotional landscape. So um, I have a storm of uh, ideas and comments. So uh, I will give you all and you pick the ones you okay. want to carry to the last. <laughs> so, uh, so I was, yes. So I was, I was thinking and I've been thinking along time in a friend of mine he he passed away now and uh, he was not diagnosed or at least not not publicly spoken um, about his diagnosis in case he knew one uh, but um, that's that's Peter Taylor and uh, he was the most accomplished man I can think of uh, a true friend and um, for, for all the people that were really close to him. And uh, he did something amazing, but at the time I did not realize. He was creating his own devices for interaction with other people. So uh, his devices were mostly done through workshops where everything was structured. So the plan was presented ahead. Uh, you would go there and you would present your bio. You, everybody would have the, the same amount of time. And, uh, and then you would carry on from structured event to structured event. Unplanned events were also structured. So you had the structure for the unplanned events. You have a structure for walking. You have a structure for conversations. And the first time that I attend one of his workshops, I thought this man is absolutely crazy. There's no touch. I mean, there is no 
close interaction unmediated uh, apart from this structure. And uh, all he wanted was to create an infrastructure that was aiming for collaborations and uh, communication. Uh, he was also very fun of the Quakers and, uh, and their methodology where you can help someone by not giving advice. Uh, you just make questions that the person can answer or not. It's just aimed to help the person reflecting uh, on, uh, on what their real motivations are. Um, it took me years to understand the importance of this proposal uh, for neurodivergent people. That is what technology can bring us, but in the sense technology that doesn't have to be uh, dev physical devices, but uh, technology that can overcome uh, difficulties, differences or deficiencies to enable communication. Uh, and this can be what we are a little bit trying here, small things, asynchronous events, time for processing. Um, and now we have this at our disposal. I mean, we can communicate asynchronously. We, in the past, they could write letters, but I mean, now you can send videos. Uh, you can wait a video reply. You can, uh, you can wait what we will try here. That is the people that are now seeing, or seeing us or listening to us. They can leave their questions or comments. On, uh, on the comment boxes. Uh, and then um, you can return to these, pick the ones you want to answer later on, which is a quite a degree of freedom, not having to feel the pressure to respond immediately. So, uh, so this importance of developing technologies for communication is something that I would like to, well, leave you in the air a little bit. And, um, and the other one, because this will be big enough, and uh, yes, we have to put an end to some moment. <laughs> um, uh, the other one uh, that is personal, but you also approached it before here in during our talk, that is motherhood. And motherhood at the same time is like the opposite of what we have just said, that is motherhood, is that now or never uh, constant feeling, having to respond immediately uh, upon survival requests uh, for both parts. So, uh, so, so yeah, so these are the ones that I leave you also with the total freedom to give any full remarks that you wish to the end. Uh, okay, so the technology one and communication fits. I feel like we have a theme to this talk, which has been the way we exchange meaning. Um, definitely, that's something that can be very enabling. You know, when we think about people who face very significant barriers to access, who are able to communicate using um, text to speech devices or communication aids like that, that's incredible. Um, in my work, people with profound and multiple learning disabilities who've been enabled to communicate using eye gaze technology, extraordinary stuff. Um, it's not like you say, it's not just technology because for me, uh, a mobile phone is not a useful communication tool aside from it being a pocket computer, whereas Zoom is. And people, uh, they'll say, they'll say, oh, it's easier to phone. Oh, I had, I was, I was trying to buy a house recently and the estate agent kept sending us emails and saying, it's easier to discuss this on the phone. And my husband was amazing because he would write back and go for you. It is not easier for Joe to discuss this on the phone because I won't take in the information. I'll just, I will have to concentrate so much on giving the correct, you know, social responses that I won't know what's been said. Um, but on Zoom, I find it a much easier communication medium than possibly anything else. Um, because on Zoom, I can communicate and just focus on the communication. It's a bit like that taking your shoes off thing to give your attention to the room. Um, if I were talking, if we were face to face, I would be um, thinking about the answers to your questions. 
but I would also be wondering if I had made the right facial expression at the right time in response, to, you know, did I show that I was listening? Because I know that there are all these other ways of expressing meaning and I want to get them all right, not wrong. That's that binary brain. And there's an interesting one there that, you know, there's, there's so much of this that's interesting, but you know, that need to be right, not wrong is also a need to be safe not in danger to be good not bad if I get something wrong I don't just feel it as a wrongness I feel unsafe and I feel like I'm a bad person they all overlap each other um, but on zoom I I watch myself to check that I'm making the facial expressions that should go with the things that I'm saying that I make a sad face when I say a sad thing and a happy face and that I show you my attention um, to what you're saying that I that I do the responsive gestures and being able to do that just by looking is much easier than being able to do it backstage in your brain thinking am I making the facial expression how would that facial expression feel which muscles would feel tight I can't really feel those muscles to know if I'm making them and and it's just a big thing that turns and it's not there on zoom because I can just I can just interact freely and the um freedom that I find in conversation on social media has been amazing on social media I'm a good communicator and in life I'm not um so yes I think there's there's loads there and I can totally get the structuring of his workshops I've just started a PhD and as part of that I'm being invited to I'm being I was invited to an induction event on zoom I've got another day long something and I don't know what it is I don't know if it's a day of lectures I don't know if I'm going to have to go into breakout groups with with other people I don't know if I'm going to be expected to ask questions um, and that not knowing is very difficult for me so there's a lack of access there for me because I don't know what those events are whereas if they were very structured and I'd got a predictable format I would know and could access those events so I, I like the sound of Peter's events um, your your last one was motherhood that is that is a massive topic um, Motherhood and pregnancy uh, are something that I began to touch on at the end of the subtle spectrum. Uh, that, that thing I've just said about the estate agent and information on the phone. I had my baby during the pandemic. Um, we were in lockdown in the UK, so I wasn't able to go and see the healthcare professionals. And so the midwife would phone me and tell me stuff. And I don't know what the stuff was. And I would think, well, that's OK. I just need to concentrate more. I just need to um, pay attention more. I, I just need to take notes. And there's a photo on my Facebook of the notes that I tried to take and, and they, they weren't anything. And you feel like such a failure, you know, cause that was important information that she's giving me. She's giving me information that's to do with the safety of my baby. Um, and I've not, taken it in um, and I've tried you know and I tried harder you know I'll take a notepad I'll write it down um, and then I can't do it and it's very humiliating um, yeah it's very humiliating and to have to admit to my husband I'm you know I'm sorry I I don't know what the midwife said to us um, and again he's he's an incredible advocate because he then phoned the midwifery services and said you need to make adaptations here um, but several times during my pregnancy my being autistic threatened the life of my baby and once after my baby was born my being autistic not my being autistic those communication differences across the neuro divide um, threatened my life um, so so I had a a very sort of serious emergency situation that came about because I wasn't understanding the communication in the way that it was intended so there are huge health things but that's not motherhood and parenthood motherhood and parenthood is a is a different bigger topic um and it's probably one we have to leave for another time isn't it perfect would you like to say anything else or should we leave it here? Uh, just that I'm very 
friendly on social media so if people want to come and make connections with me they'll find me on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and I'm always happy to meet people who are interested in neurodiversity in a more inclusive world. Thank you very much Joanna it was great having you here and talking to you here it was lovely to have you. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me.